This video tutorial provides an introduction to programming in PROC LCA, and it accompanies the appendix material presented in the paper PROC LCA Assess Procedure for Latent Class Analysis by Stephanie T. Lanza, Linda M. Collins, David R. Lemon, and Joseph L. Schaefer, published in Structural Equation Modeling in 2007, Volume 14, Issue 4, pages 671 to 694. First, let's start with Appendix A, SAS Syntax for Baseline Model. First, I'm going to put a comment that reminds us what model we're fitting. In this case, we're fitting the five-class model. Next, I invoke the procedure PROC LCA by typing PROC LCA, and I specify the data set to be used by saying data equals alcohol. In this case, we're using the alcohol data set. Next, I add a title, which will appear at the top of all of the pages of output. To be clear, I've specified a five-class model with seven items. The end class statement specifies the number of latent classes in the model. Here, we have five. Next, the item statement specifies, in order, the items to be included in the latent class model. Here, we have lifetime alcohol use, past year alcohol use, past month alcohol use, lifetime drunkenness, past year drunkenness, past month drunkenness, and past two week binge drinking. The category statement specifies the number of response options for each of the items included in the model. In this case, all seven items are binary, so they each get a two. The seed statement specifies a random seed, which will generate a set of random starting values to be used by the maximum likelihood estimation procedure. We have a run to run the model. To run the model, as with any SAS procedure, I highlight the program and click the little running man icon at the top of the SAS window. Once the program is finished running, I check the log window to be sure that there are no errors, and then I look at the output window to see my output. The output is discussed in more detail in the paper, but here we see that first we get some information about the model, including the number of participants, number of measurement items, number of response categories per item, number of groups in the data, number of latent classes, and the fact that the starting values were randomly generated using a seed. No parameter restrictions were specified, and then we see information about model convergence. This is followed by the fit statistics. On the second page of the output, we have the parameter estimates. First, we have the latent class membership probabilities, and then the item response probabilities. These parameter estimates are discussed in more detail in the paper, including the naming of the latent classes. Keep in mind that the latent classes come out in a random order, and these, this order may be different than the one presented in the paper. Now, what if we want to add a grouping variable for gender to see dif gender differences in latent class membership probabilities or in the item response probabilities? Appendix B includes SAS syntax for models with a grouping variable. To include gender as a grouping variable in this model, first I'm going to copy and paste this program and then change my comment. First, I'm going to fit this model without measurement invariance across the groups. To add gender as a grouping variable, I add the group statement with gender. Then, because I want to be able to keep track of the groups more easily in the output, I'm going to use the group names statement. Males are one in this data and females are two, so we put them in order. Then we run this program. We check the log to make sure there are no errors. And then we look at the output. Again, on the first page, we see information about our model and our fit statistics. On the second page, we have our parameter estimates. Now, because we included gender as a grouping variable, we have latent class membership probabilities for males, latent class membership probabilities for females, 
And then because we did not impose measurement of variance across groups, we have item response probabilities for males, response category 1 and category 2, and then a set of res item response probabilities for females, response category 1, and then response category 2 continues down. To take this model and impose measurement invariance across groups, first I'm going to change my comment. Now, to impose measurement invariance across groups, meaning that the item response probabilities for males are equal to the item response probabilities for females, I'm going to use the measurement statement and I'm going to impose measurement invariance across groups. We run this model, check the log quickly, and then take a look at the output. Now, again, we have our information about the model, and we see here that row measurement parameters were constrained to be equal across groups. Our fit statistics, and then our parameter estimates. We still have latent class membership probabilities for males and females, but because of the measurement invariance restrictions imposed across groups, now we only have one set of item response probabilities for males and females together. Once we investigate group differences, perhaps we'd like to add a covariate for grades or for skipping school. To do this, I again will copy my baseline model, paste it below, and first I'm going to add a covariate for, for grades. To add a covariate, I add the covariate statement. And I'm going to look at the covariate for grades first. I'm going to run this. Check the log, and then take a look at the output. Scroll up. Again, we have our information about the model and our fit statistics. Notice here that we don't have the fit statistics um, for the G-squared, AIC, and BIC, because we recommend conducting your model selection prior to adding covariates, and so here we only output the log likelihood. Second page, we again have our latent class membership probabilities and our item response probabilities. But now we also have our beta estimates, which are the multinomial logistic regression coefficients quantifying the effect of the predictor on latent class membership. We have the estimates and the odds ratios that correspond to those estimates. Then on the third page, we have our p-values. Here, we can see that grades is a highly significant predictor of latent class membership. To instead look at skipping school as a covariate, we add our skipping school variable to our covariate statement. Now, let's say we wanted to change our reference latent class for the multinomial logistic regression. Before, we did not specify a reference latent class, so latent class 1 was used as the default. Let's instead use latent class 4. So we use the reference statement, specify that we'd like to use latent class 4, and we rerun this. check our log, and then look at our output. The output for skipping school looks very similar to that of grades. We have our model information, our fit statistics, latent class membership probabilities, item response probabilities, and our beta estimates. And we take a quick look at our p-value and we see that skipping school is also a highly significant predictor of latent class membership. However, let's go up one page. And what we see here in the beta estimates is that now latent class 4 is used as our reference latent class. Before, when skipping school was our latent class, our reference latent class, it was latent class 1. So here is the output from grades, and we see that latent class 1 is used as the default reference latent class for the multinomial logistic regression. Whereas here we specified latent class 4 for skipping school, so latent class 4 is used as a reference for the multinomial logistic regression. 
For more information about these models, including how to interpret the item response probabilities, please see the article. And for more information about the Methodology Center and software that we provide, please visit our website, methodology.psu.edu.